Sci-Fi Theatre. First Love by Ivan Turgenev. Translated and dramatized by Joan O'Connor. With Simon Cadell, Rosalind Ayres, John Carson, and Hugh Dixon. That tune. My manservant used to play it. What memories it brings back. Memories of 1833 when my father rented the summer house outside Moscow. I was 16 years old and 40 now. 40. But the years have given me to understand those wild feelings, those seething desires which gripped and racked and bewildered me at 16, innocent, half-awakened boy that I was. To begin with, I wandered about the grounds my gun under my arm, in my pocket the book on Roman history, and in my heart a turbulence, an inexplicable sensation of longing. Sometimes I sang, sometimes I was overcome by weeping, and always it seemed that my imagination hovered, like Martins settling a belfry at dawn, around some presentiment of something new, something ineffably sweet. I was very solitary. My mother was a melancholy stranger, jealous and frightened of my father, and my father, how I admired him. His authority, his elegance, his charm, and that mercurial quality of his that half frightened me. He had sudden moods of gaiety, in which he would pet me, romp with me, followed by moods when he would freeze as only he could freeze. All tenderness vanished without trace. He had married my mother for her money. My tutor told me that. And she was ten years older than he was. But his happiness mattered to me less than my own. And I kept repeating to myself, life can't always be so dull. Something must happen. Some more peace no, thank you, Mother. And you will be out. No more, thanks. Then you may clear the table, Fyodor. Thank you, madam. Did you know there are people moved into the annex, Mother? I saw faces at the windows. No. Fyodor, I thought it was agreed that the building and the grounds would remain empty all summer. Well, there was no firm agreement. Do you know who has taken the annex, Fyodor? Yes, Excellency. It's a princess, Zazieke, and her daughter. Her daughter? Yes, Excellency. Up, they just three is first chicks to move them in. And the furniture's very cheap looking. The cook and I remarked. Yes. Thank you. Still, I'm glad something is happening. They won't be people you'll care to know. What family of the slightest importance would want a small rickety place like that? The garden the size of a tea tray. As to the woman being a princess, princesses are too opinion in Russia these days. I go crocheting, I think. Crocheting? You should take out your books and study. I wish your father hadn't dismissed the tutor. You're far too lazy ever to reach university level. The tutor was useless. He spent all day lolling on his bed, and when he deigned to come downstairs, he was arrogant and boring. He seemed to imagine he was superior to everyone by reason of being a Frenchman. <laughs> go along, Vladimir. Enjoy your liberty. You have your pony. Be adventurous. Ride out into the country, as I do. Make the most of summer out of Moscow. You've spent all May wandering about the grounds. That's enough of it, surely. I will say, my... I think I'll take my gun to the wood this afternoon, Father. I might take my books, too, and sit on the bench by the fountain for a bit. Oh. Do as you like. I went out. It was the last day of May, warm and enticing, and 
I well remember wandering endlessly with lowered eyes among the trees. My mind filled with hatred for the crows, and knowledge that I never should one. Then, of a sudden, I was aware of voices and laughter, and found myself close to the low fence between our grounds and the narrow strip of garden belonging to the annex, and there I saw four young men crowded around a girl. A girl in a pink striped dress, and wearing a white straw hat with pale blue ribbons. A girl more alluring than any dream, more enchanting than any picture. Gazing at her, I almost cried out aloud in wonder and delight. My eyes devoured the gold, disheveled hair beneath that hat's brim. The eyes half hidden by black lashes, the graceful neck, the slender waist. And then a voice shouted, A young man had any way to behave, staring at strange young lady. I was dumbfounded. A brown-haired was I, smiling ironically, and the girl had turned towards me. I saw her lively, laughing face. Her large, intelligent grey eyes, the gleam of her white teeth, my heart plunged wildly. In my enchantment, my gun had slipped from my hands. I'd forgotten everything. Now I snatched it up and ran for home. Never before had I felt so agitated. So at the same time, shamed and happy. Master Vladimir, you're late for tea. You look dazed. Have you shot a crow at last? No, no, it isn't that. It's the... no, it's nothing. Um, brush my jacket down, will you, Philippe? I, I then take my gun back to the gun room. I'm not very late, am I? Twenty minutes. Hold still. No, that'll do. Thank you. I right, have a non-committal letter, which would discourage her. She's plainly an ill-bred, tiresome woman. So see, she doesn't bother you. Were the crows particularly fascinating this afternoon? Or did you become engrossed in your volume of Kaidanov and his reflections on Julius Caesar? I forgot to look at my watch. Oh, I see. Day drinking. Well, I've drunk my tea, and I shall ride to the postbox, send off my letters. Princess Sasyakin at home. Morning, Marty. Yes, but... Have you been to the police station yet? No. I'm only one pair of legs. Then there's someone called to see you. Who? The young gentleman from next door. Oh, show him in. Better come in. That's the drawing room. Thank you. That's right. So, you're our neighbour's son. Yes, madam. I've come with a message from my mother. Bunny party! Have you seen my keys? No! Uh, uh, my mother asked me to say that she received your letter and will oblige you in any way she can. Did she write me a reply? She didn't. But she'd be happy to receive you today after one o'clock. That will suit you. Yes, I'll come. Tell her I'll be shocked to come. You look very young. How old are you? Sixteen. Oh, I'm saying. Well, you mustn't stand on ceremony with us here. We're all very simple. Take us as you find us. Most kind. Zinaida. This is my daughter, young man. 
Zinaida, this is Monsieur Voldemar's son. What's your name, friend? Vladimir. And your patronymic? Petrovich. I used to know a chief of police called Vladimir Petrovich. Bonnie Potty! Yes? You needn't look for the keys, they're in my pocket. No wonder I couldn't find them. I've seen Monsieur Is there anything you have to do just now, Lady me? No. No, nothing. Would you care to help me wind some wool? Yes. I should like that. Then come with me. My sitting room's this way. Oh, here's the wool. I'll sit on this chair, and you bring up that one and put it opposite me. Now sit down. Hold out your arms straight in front of you. I'm going to stretch the skein over your hands. Huh? And wind it off onto this card. I wonder what you thought of me yesterday, Monsieur Vladimir. I suppose you thoroughly disapproved of me. Oh, no. <laughs> Princess, I, I was just... You don't know me yet. You'll find me a strange creature. And one of the strange things about me is I always want everyone to tell me the truth. I heard you say you were 16. But I'm 21, so you see how much older I am than you. You must tell me the truth. Unfailingly. And obey me. Look at me. Why won't you look me in the face? I like you. I feel we're going to be friends. Don't you like me? Princess? In the first place, you must call me Zinaida. And in the second, I must tell you I hate the way children, young men, have of not speaking straight out. Leave that to the grown-ups. So, you do like me? Of course I do. That's better. Have you a tutor? Oh, no. No, not for a long time. Ah. So, you're quite a man already. Now, hold your arms. Zinaida, the Arab Zorov has brought you a kitten. A kitten? Oh, lovely. Oh, look. Kitten, look. Oh, such a funny little thing. And you are a funny little kitten. <laughs> its eyes are blue, they're green, and it's striped like a tiny wild cat. Look what great big ears. Oh, thank you, you're a dear. You were pleased to say you wanted a kitten with big ears, so I looked for one and got one. Your word is law. Oh, how gallant. He's a real hussar. Oh, it's hungry. Bonifati, bring a saucer of milk. Very good. Oh, look at its little rosy tongue. <laughs> What do you want? Your hand. In thanks for the kitten. I'll give you both hands. Take them. That's enough. One would imagine you were thanking me. Why should he kiss my hand so fervently, Monsieur Vladimir? Why? Hmm? <laughs> Who's that? My manservant. What's he doing here? I'll find out. Your mama is asking how it is you didn't return the answer. Very soon she'll be getting angry. Why? Have I, have I been here long? No, but long enough for your mama. <laughs> I uh, yes, Vladimir? I'm afraid I must take my leave. Where are you going? Home. I have to tell my mother to expect a princess this afternoon. That's it. Tell her I'll come. <laughs> Say about two. Mind you visit us again, Monsieur Vladimir. Come tonight. Mind you do now. Remember what I said about obedience. <laughs> Best hurry. Did my mother seem put out? She knows about the daughter. I see. But as your papa's home, you won't get scolded yet. No, not in front of him. You know a lot about us, don't you, Philippe? 
It isn't much servants, miss. Your mama has made up her mind to dislike the princess, you know, even before she's met her. When Sonia was brushing her hair for her this morning, your mama said that she feared the neighbor was a vulgar woman. She can't say much worse about anyone, so they said. As to the young one, I can guess what sort of name she'll give her. She's very... Princess Inaida, she's... She's an extremely charming young lady. Oh, you know, I can see that. She took your fancy, all right? No. It was just a... Oh, she's very charming. Look out she doesn't catch you, Master Vladimir. She means to. I saw the way she looked at you. She knows how to set a snare, that one. You remember the saying, once the little birdie's claw is caught, goodbye birdie. So look out, even if you are only 16. You don't understand, Philly. No? No. Well, you've no obligation to speak to her. No, but it's difficult. She's a neighbor, and the name, after all, is a good one. Yes. As a matter of fact, I remember now who the lady is. I never know. I used to know her husband, the late Prince Zazyekin. He gambled away a huge fortune, and then, for money, presumably, though God knows he might have made a better choice, married the daughter of a rich manufacturer, speculated, Lost all her money and died, leaving her with nothing but debts. And here she is with the annex. I hope she doesn't try to borrow from him. I should think that's exactly her intention. Someone told me the daughter's a nice girl, though. And very well educated and speaks excellent French. I don't suppose you ever saw any little trauma in your life. No. Thank God. That being the case, my dear, you can scarcely be a judge of what they look like. I shall go out riding now. I shall go out too, Mother. Very well. But take off that good jacket first. What possessed you to put it on for those people? I don't know. Seem polite. It's us yeek. I suppose you will at least let us explain to Monsieur Vladimir Voldemar what is the law that you are so ready to break. I never saw anyone look so completely at a loss as he does. <laughs> We're playing forfeits, young man. Ever played forfeits? No. Uh, to cut it short, the princess has been fined and has to pay a forfeit. We shall all draw tickets from the hat, and the one who draws the lucky ticket with the word kiss on it is entitled to kiss the princess's hand. <laughs> You'll understand the game as it goes on. I suggest that you, my darling, being a poet, show magnanimity, and let's see Vladimir draw your ticket as well as his, and he'll have 
two chops. Oh, oh, I'm done, I will. <laughs> That's right, no favorites. Have you been pushed into party? I shall be, don't worry. That's enough. I'm going to shake the hat and do all draw. Oh, I shall be lucky. Only one. Thank you. No. Well, Monsieur Vladimir, aren't you going to unfold yours? Kiss. Oh, bravo, he's the one. I'm so glad. Are you glad, Vladimir? <laughs> aren't you glad, Vladimir? Of course. So, Vladimir, I'll give you a hundred rubles. No. I heard. We lost so well. Oh, look at my young hero. His eyes sparkle like black fire. He won't sell. I wouldn't sell it for any money. Bravo. But as master of ceremonies, I insist on strict rules from now on. Monsieur Vladimir, go down on one knee before the princess. <laughs> One knee's not enough for him. He's got to fall on two knees. Oh, don't scoff, Malievsky. Two knees are better than I enter a protest against allowing children to join our circle. <laughs> you stay beside me, Vladimir, and never mind their teasing. I've decided we shall stop playing forfeits. The game only leads to trouble. Let's play at being gypsies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, we'll dress yes, Niematsky up as a bear and make oh, him die. Oh, yeah. oh, no. And I'll be the gypsy queen and hold his chain. And Vladimir will be my page. And the rest of you can fight for the privilege of proffering for my hand. No, no, I, I refuse to be a bear. I'm as much right to the princess's hand as any of you. I... But you should be my pet. My pet bear. No. If anyone's to make a fool of himself, I put forward the Elizorox, the candidate. Oh, what? what a clown you are. We'll drop the idea of a bear and sit around the campfire singing gypsy songs. And Bonnie Farty can find us something to eat. And we'll have Card tricks or dance steps. Yes, dance steps. I'll be judge, and the best dancer should dance with me as his prize. Oh, okay. Well, we don't know any gypsy songs, so let's go straight to the dancing contest. Yes. Open the piano. <laughs> you play for us, my darling. We'll toss to decide who begins. Put the coin somewhere. Uh, my yeah. Catch. Now, thanks. So play, my darling. Heads or tails, dear Matsky? Uh, tails. It's heads. Oh. You're on my feet. <laughs> next, me next. I choose heads. Ha! I don't care to dance. But you will, then. No, no, my darling, play something. Don't you pretend you're not in my power. Give me your hand. Here. I'm going to stick the pin of my brooch into it, and you'll feel humiliated before this young man. Ah. And yet you'll laugh. <laughs> learned and unfettered doctor. Now join the others and dance. Princess. Come, my page. Come and sit close to me. Close enough. Let them get on with their nonsense and you shall whisper your secrets to me. What? You have no secrets? Oh. Then I'll put this silk handkerchief over both our heads we shall be together in the dark, quite still and quiet, until those idiots notice us. It's almost daylight. I know. And your mother sent for me about ten. She wanted me to fetch you, but your father wouldn't hear of that. I, I don't know if you'd say anything. They knew where I was. Well, where else could you be? I forgot everything when I was there, Billy. I just, I just didn't think. No, I reckon not. You go to sleep again. I'll undress myself. All right. My passion dated from that night. 
My feelings must have been something like those of a man starting out on a career of service. So you had a happy evening, did you? Yes, Father, very. I only didn't talk about it at lunch, because... Well, that is in case Mama wasn't pleased. So I supposed. And, of course, you mustn't displease Mama. But you can talk now. Who was at the party? Tell me. The old princess, some of the time, and the princess and Aida, and five men visitors, they come every evening. Do they? And how did you amuse yourselves? We played games. Games like children play. Children's games. <laughs> I wonder. Well, it's only right you should enjoy yourself at your age. You're not alone too much filling your head with poetry and romantic novels. It's time you grew up, plunged into life, looked for pleasures, excitements, conquests. I wish I could be like you. I never will be, though. To return to your party. What of your hostess? I hardly saw her. She's really quite a nice lady. She didn't seem to mind the romping a bit. I meant your young hostess. Sinaida. She's wonderful. And do all her main friends find her wonderful? Yes, they do. Although she treats them oddly. Sometimes she's sweet to them, and sometimes she's almost unkind. And they seem to be rather jealous of one another, perhaps? Or perhaps a little. I couldn't quite make them out. It was all so extraordinary, like a scene from another world. As a matter of fact, I didn't understand what was going on a lot of the time. But you enjoyed yourself. That's right. I'm glad. Take what occasion offers. Take, but never surrender your true inner self. That's my advice. Do you understand me, Vladimir? Not really. Freedom is what I'm speaking of. Freedom. That essential element in a man's life. And do you know what gives a man freedom? No. His will. Through it he achieves power, and power will make him free. Learn to know what you want, take it, and you'll be free to command others. But I've never thought of wanting to command others. <laughs> well, well, you're young yet. Forget it for the present. One day you'll know what I... Ah, is that your young princess? Walking along her garden path, really? Yes. Yes, that's her. She glanced up at us, but she didn't seem to recognize you. No. I expect she's too deep in thought. Well, what will you do this afternoon? I heard you say you were going riding. May I come too? No. You go by yourself if you want to ride, or take your man Philippe for company if you care to. I've changed my mind. I shan't go riding today. But then what Get along to the stables and tell them to unsaddle the chestnut. Yes, Father. Have a pleasant ride. I went out again that night to the annex. I couldn't keep away. The old princess received me with her peculiar form of graciousness. You're welcome, my dear boy, but there's no one else here. The Countess Charlie arrived, and my daughter told me to send them back to their homes. Who could see them, she said. I asked if Zinaida had made an exception for me and had my hopes crushed by the princess's reply. To know that I was in the same house as in Aida was a sort of joy, and I had settled to my task when the door to the little adjoining sitting room opened a crack, and Zinaida's face, pale and thoughtful, appeared in the opening. Her hair was carelessly combed back, and she stared into the room with big, cold eyes, and at first I thought she didn't see me. It seemed she looked straight through me. Then I realized that, quite on the contrary, she did see me and was staring at me, staring into my eyes as though some power enabled her to see through them to my very soul. She closed the door again with quiet deliberation. I lowered my pen to the page to resume my writing, but my hand was trembling. I felt obscurely afraid for Zinaida and as violently affected by her silence as one might be by a wild cry of anguish heard in a dark street at night. Of course, the meaning of the incident was hidden from me. 
I was not yet equipped to understand or even guess at such meanings. So, you won't go crow shooting again then? Not at all. Don't think so. A few weeks ago, you thought of nothing else. Beat you, did they? Those crows? It's not that thing. As if I didn't know. You shouldn't ought to stay locked up in your room as you do. You may tell your mama you're studying in here, but I know better. And when you are out, you're sitting like us, not on that wall with your feet dangling and peering into somebody's garden. Oh, I see. And don't mind me saying this, Mr. Vladimir, but you're wasting your time. That's my business. You're like a beetle tied with a leg and spinning round and round that annex. You've been spinning all June, and you'd be spinning all July too if it wasn't that sometimes the young lady turns you out. No one turns me out, Philippe. How dare you? Fine words, young master. But I see plainly enough in your face when you come back here and shut yourself in that you don't come back for choice. You're either up in the air or down in the mud these days. I mean, you're never in some in-between place where you could enjoy things as a boy should. If you'll excuse me, young master. I'm bothered about my exams, if you say so. But I'm telling you, you'll get no good where you're looking for good, Master Vladimir. You know what they say? No bear gets honey from an empty pot. One day you'll be sorry you spent all the summer as you are doing. Your clothes, I suppose. You're a good friend to me, Philippe, but you simply can't understand how I feel. No one could. Simply. Oh, I love her. Yes, I loved her. I didn't know what love was, but in all my ignorance, I loved her. She was kind, she was cruel. She used me ruthlessly, had I but known it. I pined for her when I was away from her, yet when I was with her, I was jealous. Conscious of my insignificance, I sulked stupidly, I adored no less stupidly. I was a child, and yet not quite a child. Happy, yet unhappy. I was in love. Vladimir, I can see you. Where have you been these last years? Me. Come, jump over the fence and join me. May I? Would I ask if I didn't want you? I'm coming, then. I brought you some strawberries from our garden. You know you don't need excuses to visit me. Come and sit by me. The grass is warm. Five weeks and two days. Five weeks and two days? And are you a happier boy since you met me? Don't you want to answer me? I'm not as childish as I was five weeks ago. I didn't know what to expect of being happy five weeks ago. Very shadowed answer. Tell me, what do you think of the life I lead? I don't understand it. Your friends, they're so... Yes. But they're all necessary to me. Why? Ilovzorov, wh whom you call the beast. Who, uh, what's necessary to you about him? My knowledge that he'd rush into a sheet of flame for me if he had to. That his feeling for me is... How shall I put it? Serious? He offers me marriage every other day. But you'd never marry him, would you? No, I wouldn't. The others. I mean, Miyamatsuki with his ugly face and frizzy hair. What about him? Miyamatsuki is a sort of club. One needs a club. A club? Miyamatsuki? Oh, you're mistaken if you think clowns are happy people. They're beings whose assets are their misfortunes, and they make use of them to draw laughter from others. Often enough, cruel laughter. And the doctor? He understands me and loves me more than all the others do. He's cynical and he abuses me to my face. But he understands me. Sometimes I wish he didn't. 
And, and my Darnoff, what's he to you? After all, he's stupidly vain. He really adores the poetry. He writes more than he... Ad- more than he adores me? Hmm. That's a stupid okay. But you don't ask about Count Malievsky. Why not? <laughs> why no, why not, my little page? I notice how your blood boils when you watch him leaning elegantly over my chair, whispering in my ear. He's sly, mean and false. I don't know why you are lying here at all. <laughs> don't you? <laughs> well, 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 I'll tell you. He has such a dear little moustache. But you wouldn't understand that. <laughs> you don't honestly mean to say you think I'm in love with him, do you? I... No. I could never love a man like him. I need a man... capable of... breaking my will. And that man's name isn't Malievsky. Imagine I've already been caught in the talons of some ruthless eagle. Where is there such an eagle? Do you know? Are you saying you'll never love anybody? What about you? Don't I? Don't I love you? Forgive my moods. Um, go indoors and uh, talk to my mother. She's in the worst of tempers because she had to go twice to the local police station to explain her situation. She needs to be consoled. Princess. You love me very much, don't you? Yes, I know you do. I'm sick of it all. I can't bear it. I'd like to go away to the end of the world to escape. Escape. What is there in school? Go indoors and talk to my mother. Leave me. I'll, I'll come in very soon. Yes, Princess. with some new petition. Sit down, young man. Thank you. Tell me, what makes you come here so often? I... You ought to be studying. What do you think you're doing? Well, how do you know I don't study at home? <laughs> well, it's plainly not work you're thinking about. At your age, that's natural. It's only your choice that's so very unfortunate. I'm afraid I don't understand you. It's my duty to warn you. What about? The air here is bad for you. Believe me. What do you mean? Well, do you consider your present state healthier? Normal? Do you really think all you're going through now is good for you? What, what, what am I going through? Oh, young man. Are you telling me? That an intelligent person like yourself can remain ignorant of what's going on in this place. But what is going on? So you're really not just assuming things. Day by time. Why should I tell you? Perhaps I ought not to tell you. I'll only say that the atmosphere here is bad. You shouldn't come here anymore. I don't believe that. No, you don't want to believe anything I may have to say. Very well, go out again. Sit on the wall and watch the guests arriving. But while you watch, think about it. Think about them and this house. It's a hot house. Well, of course, a hot house is nice. It smells nice. But one shouldn't try to live in a hot house. Don't you see that? I don't understand what you're saying. I, I, I don't, really. Oh, pity. I'll do as you say. I'll go out again and breathe a little. I've got my Kaidala from my pocket. Again, would my mother not talk to you? She's 
out. There's only the doctor indoors. I see. Where are you going? Nowhere. But you've got your sunshade. You look as though you meant to walk straight out of the garden gate. I meant nothing of the kind. You see? I'm lifting my sunshade down. I was just restless, just uh, strolling around. But now you're here, we'll sit on the grass again. I've been thinking of sitting up on the wall and reading my history. I don't seem to be getting on with it lately. I just stare at the pages, reading the same sentence over and over. I don't know how many times I must have read, Julius Caesar was renowned for his bravery in battle. Ah, so you don't want to sit with me. But I want you to. What about obedience? I want you here. Come, now kneel down. I dare. <laughs> then let me see you do it. You shall. <laughs> now, you see. <laughs> you look beautiful up there, like an eaglet with its wings spread. Watch. And see if I dare jump.
Finally, my joy vented itself in leaps and bounds and foolish cries. In very truth, I was a child. You simply didn't try, Monsieur Beast. Confess it. It's not true, Zenaida. Oh, here's Vladimir. Come in, my little page. Oh, poor boy, you're limping. You had a horrid tumble, didn't you? Imagine he fell off the wall yesterday. Sit down among the cushions, Vladimir. Now, Monsieur Beast, confess. You were ready enough to find me a kitten when I asked for one, but when I asked for a horse, no. Uh, I shouldn't be able to find one quiet enough to carry him. That's just nonsense, Bright I guess plenty of animals. I know. And he vouches for all of them. But I don't trust him. And why not? Well, because... Come along, explain. Well, you see, you can't really ride. And suppose you fell. And anyway, what makes you so eager to ride all of a sudden? That's no concern of yours. Of course, if you won't find me a horse, I can ask Vladimir's father to let me one. Well, don't glare at me like that. All right. I'll get a horse for you. That's better. And mind, it's a real horse, not a cow. I mean to gallop. Mm. And would it be with Count Malievsky you mean to gallop? And why not with Malievsky? I could give you a reason. All that concerns you is I want a horse and I want it tomorrow, so find one. I'll try. But I won't be responsible for any accident you may have. Since you're so anxious for my safety, I assure you I mean to ride through the woods. So if I fall off, I'll fall on a grass path and come to no harm. Wherever you ride, and, and whoever you ride with, I'll follow you, whether you like it or not. Really? And you, Monsieur Vladimir, will you follow me too? I don't like riding with a lot of people. Oh, I see. You prefer to get at it. Well, that's enough about that. Well, Doctor, have you been banished the prisoners, Doctor? Are <laughs> we expected? Yes, you're all expected. Come in. And you, Doctor Lucian. Don't be unsociable. Come and join us. Very well. Now, all of you, sit down and let's have a quiet hour. What? No game? Today, suppose. Suppose instead we each invent a story. Something quite apart from everyday life. Something fantastic. Yes, good idea. Bilov Zorov, you begin. Not me. I can't think of anything. Nonsense. I'll help you. Oh, please. Let one of the others. No. You, come along. Imagine, oh, for example, that you're married and tell us how you treat your wife. Oh, that's impossible. I've no idea. Well, <laughs> think. Would you be a jealous husband? Yes, I'd certainly be jealous. Would you lock her up? If I'd cause. And would you remain with her all the time she was locked up? Of course I should. But suppose she got tired of living like that and managed to escape you and ran away and disappeared. Then I'd kill her. But if she ran very far? No matter how far she ran, I'd catch her and kill her. I see. And now, let's suppose it were I who was your wife. What would you do then? I should kill myself. Oh, dear. I can see your story isn't a very long one. Dramatic, then. <laughs> <laughs> now you tell us one, Princess. Yeah. One of your own. Or rather, another of your own, because you invented the Osaurus story. <laughs> All right. Listen. Imagine a beautiful palace, a summer night, and a wonderful ball in progress in the great ballroom. Imagine the room itself. The lofty ceiling, the fluted pillars, the gloriously coloured satin hangings, the paint, the gleaming gold, the flowers, the luxury on every side. Any luxury your heart could desire. You do love luxury, don't you? <laughs> Quiet. The young queen reigns in this faraway country is receiving her guests. All of them handsome, all noble, and all heartbreakingly in love with her. No women present? No. At least, yes, there are. All of them play? Not at all. All charming. But every man is in love with the queen. Ah. They crowd around her with flattering speeches, smiling, begging for her glances. She likes flattery. Who doesn't? You're impossible interrupting me every moment. You know, one last question. Is she married? What would she want with her husband? Uh, and if she doesn't want her husband, at any rate, she doesn't want her husband. Silence! 
So, the Queen sits listening to the speeches and the music of the little orchestra. But she doesn't look into the eyes of any of her lovers and guests. Six long windows stand open from floor to ceiling. And beyond them lies the park and the dark sky. The Queen is staring out of the windows. And there, among the great trees, shining like a vision, is a fountain playing, white. ready to die at my feet. But there, by the fountain, hidden in the shadows, the one I love, the one who has power over me, stands waiting. Waiting. He gives me nothing. No silks, no diamonds. But he stands waiting for me in the certainty that I shall come. myself with him in the darkness where the trees rustle the fountains splash and all this is pure invention pure fantasy even though you spoke in the first person I wonder what should we have done my friends if we had been those guests and had known who it was who stood in the park by the front I'll tell you each what you'd have done you Bielosorov would have challenged him to a duel my Darnoff you'd have composed an endless poem reviling him you Niamatsky would have make faces at him and you doctor mm -hmm. I don't know what you would have done I'd have advised the queen not to give a ball if she didn't feel in the mood for entertaining and what about you count me I know what you'd have done you'd have given the man at the fountain a poisoned chocolate and the boy here Faithful, innocent, ignorant page as he is, would have been holding up his queen's train while she ran off into the park. How dare you, Count Malievsky? I never gave you the right to be insolent. I must ask you to leave my house at once. Yes, leave, Count. Don't be frightened, boy. No need to be frightened. I shall see you tomorrow, Princess. I'll play as a two. Yes, two, my darling. What's happened, Zinaida? Nothing. Bring me a glass of iced water. Doctor, give her a scolding. Iced water's bad for her with her weak chest. What harm can it do me? I catch cold and die. I wouldn't mind that much. Is life such a fine thing? Iced water gives me a moment's pleasure. Do you tell me I oughtn't to risk my life for a moment of Glasses, Doctor, you'll see I'm in no mood for whims. But I'll admit I like to fool you all and myself into the bargain. As for independence, Vladimir, stop pulling that long face. I, I can't stand to be pitied. some lying excuse. You're just an eavesdropper, just a spy, aren't you? And you, Count Malievsky? Me? But I'm the villain in the fairy tale, isn't it, sir? Bad behavior is expected of me. Well, they made a nice pair, don't you think? Nicely suited. The princess said she was going to ask him for a mount if Bielozora couldn't find one for her. My father's always polite and obliging. He wouldn't think of refusing her a horse for the afternoon. Oh, look. Look at him. 
Kilosorum and as red as a lobster. The fool. I was going to have said that you should have been trotting after your beauteous queen instead of peeping at her from behind a tree, and you might have been even more unwanted than the hussar. Good does he think his raging jealousy will do him? He could have a fit or fling himself to his death from his saddle and she wouldn't care. You've nothing to say. A true but silent page, Jane. Where does duty call you now? Duty? Of course, duty. Don't you consider it your duty as her page to be at her side, to observe her, guard her, know who she's with both by day? What do you mean by that? Oh, I should have thought my meaning was perfectly clear. The day isn't so important. It's light during the day. Plenty of people about. But who knows what goes on at night? Take my counsel. Keep on the alert at night. Watch. Remember the park. The moonlight. The fountain. And the man. <clears throat> but I see you do remember. Don't you want to find out who the man is? Hmm? Well, his father taught me how to make any blade sharp as a razor. Use a stone that's been smoothed by the river. That's how. But this knife of yours isn't the kind of tool you need, young master. It isn't a craftsman's knife. I know about knives. My father was reckoned to be the finest carver in the village. And in winter, when the ground was too hard to work, he'd sit with a stove and carve hour after hour. Bears and uh, foxes. But he used small blades and little chisels. But still, you could try your hand with this to start with, I suppose. There, it's fit to skin a pig with now. You'd best be sure and keep it closed. Thank you, Philippe. And I'll get downstairs and give Theodore a hand with silver. Will you wear your velvet jacket tonight? I think so. Right, I'll clean the cuffs now. Thank you. stepped lightly by me without seeing me, and passed on, leaving the jealous, bloodthirsty Othello transformed into a shivering schoolboy. In my fright, I dropped my knife, I let it lie, its blade glittering on the path, and my mind in a turmoil, I rose and turned for home. But on my way, I stopped by the stone bench near the fountain and stood gazing up at Zinaida's window. The little convex panes were a dim blue in the starlight. Suddenly, their colour changed, and behind them I saw distinctly a blind being cautiously, gently lowered till it touched the window sill and then hung, motionless. The suspicions which now entered my mind were so new and strange and evil that I fought against them, tried desperately not to admit them, tried not to see any connection between my father's passing on tiptoe through the garden and the blind being drawn down over Zinaida's window. <laughs> now, Master Vladimir, you must get to bed. Look, I, I brought you a glass of vodka. You drink it and I'll help you undress and you get under the cover. <laughs> Come on now. If only I'd seen you going out at that hour, I'd have stopped you. I knew enough for that. What did you do? That whoever you'd see out there wouldn't do you no good. Here now. Now drink this and you'll sleep sound. And forget the troubles of you. Come on, toss it down. There isn't a girl in all Russia who's worth so many tears. I understand, Master Vladimir. I do, it's just... I haven't the words to say, sir, but I promise you I know all right how the moment comes when your eyes get to see for the first time what goes on in the world. 
it isn't too bad, you know, after you get used to what you see. I reckon you've been a boy too long, Master Vladimir. Finish this drink and go to sleep and you won't know anything for hours. And when you wake up, well, it will be another day. Call the young master, he'll be needing his breakfast. Breakfast? It's near midday. Must have been here. Oh, you're awake. Yes. It's time you got up. Cook us some coffee and eggs for you in the breakfast room. You'll, you'll have to eat alone. I'm not sorry for that. Why? It was late, for one thing. And your father, he's, he's had some tea and he's been over to the annex and now he's in his study, not to be disturbed. And my mother? She's in her room, locked in. Locked in? Is she ill? You slept sound, all right. There was a terrible scene last night between the two of them, over an anonymous letter. The noise, every word your mother said, rang through the house. It's good you didn't hear. The windows fell rattle. But what was it about? What? The letter. An anonymous letter, but who said That isn't known, of course, but what it was about, there's no secret there. Your father was very careful this time, but in the end, what didn't come out would go on the back of a postage stamp. But the quarrel? Well, your mother got the letter. It was addressed to her and dropped through the front door last night. Theodore handed it to her. Well, yes. It accused your father of carrying on with the young lady next door. It's something we all knew about, except you and your mother. She guessed. And the long and the short of it is, we're going back to town today and I'm to pack your things. Well, it, it's all right. You don't need to say anything, Mr. Bloody After what you saw in the garden last night, Yeah. You put on your dressing gown and go to the breakfast room. Your coffee will be cooling. Thank you, Philly. And, and there's your slippers. A few days ago, Count Valley Epson, you were ordered out of a silk house. Today, without going into any explanations, I have the honor to tell you that if ever you make any attempt to enter any house of mine again, I shall throw you out of the window. I guess that. I don't care for your handwriting, Count. That's why. say no more, except that you should remember in future that it's been advised for young people to involve themselves in the doings of their lives. Understand? Yes. I regret that you should, as you appear to do, feel yourself personally injured by anything that may have felt or seen. It lacks a dangerous business. The process of living a man does get injured, yet he recovers. He recovers gone. Don't look so sullen. Learn to laugh at yourself. At my age, one may not laugh so freely, but at sixteen. <laughs> at sixteen, everything's a game. We're going back to town today. Enjoy yourself there. Make just friends and friends like this. Rap all you've been mixing with down here. We'll find some young people for you to study with us. Go along now. Have letters or so far to be seen to. Don't do anything silly. I've been waiting quite a while on this side of the fence to see you coming along on the other side. You had intended to jump over it. You had meant to pay a farewell visit here. I mean to. How did you know we were leaving? I have eyes. I happened to come early this afternoon and I can see things being carried out of a house as easily as the next man. It was only a matter of time when your secrets ceased to be secrets. Your family left. 
tried to warn you, but you were too innocent to grasp my meaning. Yes. I recognize that now. I've waylaid you to give you some advice. Yes. Don't say goodbyes here. You said your goodbyes in what the romantic novelists call your heart. I leave it at that. Very soon, I predict, the misery would have gone out of your eyes, and you'll look like a human being again, instead of a lap dog. Now, will you start to work seriously for the university? Ah, oh, never mind. Time is a great healer. The main thing is to lead a normal life and not be swept away by your feelings. In the end, what's the good? Wherever the wave carries you, it's bad. But so long as a man can find at least one stone under his foot, there's hope for him. I speak as one who knows. Do you really? Oh, I really do. I spent many years of my life suffering from unrequited love. <laughs> In fact, though I lecture you, see before you someone who is never holding hand when it's time to tear the net and slip away. You've been offered your freedom. Take it and don't get netted another time. Turn back to your house now. Goodbye. Goodbye. Sinaida. for the summer, as we always used. Your father will go. It's almost three years since we were out of Moscow. Well, if not the country, then come for a while to St. Petersburg, when I'm in store. No. Where are you I'm to go riding with father. He has business outside the town, down at the river somewhere. Don't go. Don't go. Vladimir, I beg you, don't go. Why not? Don't allow him. He has no idea of involving me. He said someone would hold his horse for half an hour <laughs> oh, while, no. while he transacted it and I should ride off along the river and make my way home. He'd follow. This is the beginning. Beginning? Beginning of what? I shan't tell you when I ask you not to find out. You're my son and you shan't be used against me. Are you accusing father of something?
riding with your father. You've been holding them a long time, my young gentleman. You should have done as his honour said and gone off and left me to hold his. I hold that horse for him most every day. Do you? Yes. You're doing me out of good money. Over an hour you've been standing here. You ride off now, like he said. How long do you usually hold the animal? Two hours, three hours. I don't complain. It's all money to me. But the gentleman is only four doors up the street. <laughs> That's no news. I shall go and knock on the door, hurry him up. <laughs> I reckon he won't, thank you. Here, hold the bridles. I went down the side road and stopped short. At the open window of a small wooden house was my father, his back to me, flicking the skirt of his coat with his riding crop. In the room stood a woman in a dark dress, talking to him. Zinaida. My first impulse was to run, but a strange feeling, stronger than curiosity, stronger than jealousy, stronger than fear, rooted me to the ground. My father seemed to be insisting on something, and Zinaida refusing to consent. I still see her face, after all these years. Grey, beautiful, stamped with an indescribable blend of love and despair. She spoke in whispers, never raising her eyes, smiling, humbly, and stubbornly. My father shrugged his shoulders, a sure sign of impatience, and Zinaida drew herself up, stretched out her arm and my father lifted his crop and brought it down on her wrist with a hideous crack. She started, raised her arm slowly to her lips and kissed the crimsoning wheel. My father flung himself towards her and she stood, her arms outstretched, her head thrown back. The next thing I knew was that I was leaning my head against my horse's neck, tears pouring down my face, the reins of both animals clutched in my hands, and hearing my father's voice behind me. Give me my reins, won't you? My reins. Thank you. Uh, steady that. Steady. Uh, I have my whip. Steady now. Did you? Uh, Drop your whip? No. I didn't drop it. I threw it away. I saw his face change. I saw for the first and last time how much of loving kindness and deep compassion that stern face was capable. Our eyes met. Some bond seemed to unite us. Then he turned his horse and galloped away, and I was unable to catch him up. I didn't go down to dinner that night. I sat in my room, my head in my hands, and re-saw with extraordinary vividness the scene in the little room. And I said to myself, that's what love is. That's passion. Even a blow is endured, welcomed by one who loves. Some days later, I left for Petersburg. No word concerning the scene which my father knew I had witnessed passed between us, and the next time we met was in very different circumstances. How is it here? A little better. It's strange to see him ill. He was never ill. Your father? And my mother, how she? As usual, Master Vladimir. You go into the I'll take your bags upstairs. Thank you. Vladimir, I am glad you've come. Oh, I came, Mother. And at the moment your telegram arrived. What does the doctor say of you? Frankly, that he won't stand another such attack. Did you know his heart was bad? He knew he tried to make sure that I would not be told. 
doctor's opinion is that he may live for years if he's properly careful. He recover? He would be careful. He won't take advice. He'll do as he pleases if it kills him. He won't alter his way of life. I'll write to my landlady and tell her I shan't be back here. He could leave as soon as the doctor allows him to get up again, or to be more exact, as soon as he himself decides to get up and start writing about us before. Yes, go in. But don't stay long. He's weak. Your coming will save me some letter writing. I meant to write to you. How's the university? I'm happy there. I'm glad. You made friends? Oh, yes. I should give you some fatherly words of advice, I suppose. I may not see you again. Oh, no, I don't want that face. I'm tired, Father. Maybe you should try and sleep. You're the last person I'd expect to meet on the Nevsky Prospect. Since when have you been in St. Petersburg? Oh, a few months. You? Uh, two years. I'm tutor to the sons of a rich shipping magnet. It's a living. <laughs> and are you at the university? Yes. Studying history. What else? <laughs> I remember the volume of... What was it you used to carry about in your pocket? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it seems a long time ago. Well, it is. I was sorry to hear of your father's death. Thank you. He looked so young. He was. He had a series of heart attacks. How did you come to hear of it? Uh, through Dr. Lucian. Lucian? He kept up continuously with... Well, uh, with the princess. That was a difficult summer, wasn't it? But I expect your wild infatuation seems a lifetime ago by now. Have you seen her since she came to St. Petersburg? She's here? Yes. I suppose you know she married four months ago. No. No, I didn't hear of it. Uh, uh, well, that's not so surprising. You know. Seeing that... Well, it wasn't easy for her to find a husband, naturally. Her long affair made her choice of suitors narrow, to say the least. Particularly since the affair entailed uh, consequences. Oh. Have I betrayed a secret? Uh, no, no, please go on. He's a nice fellow, her husband. Ready to take on the responsibility. Lucian made the match. The man's a physician. For the moment, they're living in the Delmouth Hotel, quite near here. Shall I give you her name and address? Yes, I'm pleased. She'd be glad to see you, I know. Lucian told me she speaks of you often. I'll visit her, of course. The others of that summer party quite disappeared. I heard the Tsar got drowned somewhere in the Crimea. Oh, God. Here's the address. I've written it on the back of one of my cards. I'll go and see her immediately. I get back from Moscow. I'll have to spend a week or so with my mother. Look me up someday. And tell me how you find the princess. What a time that was, eh? That summer of the annex. Thoughts of it still haunt my dreams. 
Goodbye. Goodbye. I might have gone to see her there and then. I had, after all, simply to walk up the street. What prevented me from doing just that? The memory of the doctor's warning about the net. Perhaps. I did fear the net. I still do. Whatever the explanation, weeks passed before I went to the hotel door and asked for her and saw the hotel porter's eyes widen and knew in a flash of premonition what he was going to say. Zinaida was dead. She had died in childbirth four days earlier. Zinaida dead. I stared blankly, then walked away. I might have seen her and had not. And now I should never see her again. The bitter thought ached into my heart with all the power of remorse. So this was how that young, eager, brilliant life was fated to end. This was the destiny to which it had aspired with so much haste and so much tumult. I thought of those beloved features, those grey eyes, that gold hair in a narrow wooden box lying in the damp, dark earth, not far from me. Me, who was still living, and perhaps not many yards from where my father lay. Oh, youth. Youth! Careless of everything, you appear to possess all the treasures of the universe. Grief itself is a source of entertainment to you. Even sorrow adorns you. Confident and arrogant, you declare, Behold, I alone live. Yet your days fly by, leaving no trace behind, and everything you are vanishes like wax melting in the sunlight, like snow. It may be that youth's charm lies not in its ability to achieve anything, but in its ability to believe that there is nothing it could not achieve. And though we recklessly expend forces for which we find no uses, each one of us claims at the end the right to say what could I not have achieved had I not so vainly wasted my life? And here am I. What did I hope for then? What brilliant future did I not anticipate, even as I bade farewell to the spectre of my first love? And what of all I hoped for has come true? Now, as the shadows begin to fall across my path. Is there anything more radiant, more precious to me, than the memories of that short-lived early morning storm in spring? In First Love, by Ivan Turgenev, translated and dramatized by Joan O'Connor, the part of Vladimir was played by Simon Goodell, and Zinaida by Rosalind Ayres. Vladimir's father, Hugh Dixon, and his mother, Penelope Lee. Dr. Lushin, John Carson, Count Malievsky, Michael Cochran, Bielov Sorov, Brian Carroll, Maidanov, Philip Sully. Nirmatsky, Michael McStay. Princess Zasyekina, Antonia Pemberton. Philippe, William Nye. Vonifati, John Bott. And Fyodor, Alan Mason. The music for guitar was arranged and played by Eric Hill. The pianist was John Fraser. The play was directed by Jane Morgan. <laughs>